Hi and welcome to the Honours Channel. You find me very far from home today. We are just around the corner from Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and I'm here to interview the facial plastic surgeon, Dr. Carl Truesdale. He's made a name for himself, not just in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, but also on social media too, where he has a huge Instagram platform and he's soon to launch a show on YouTube called Beyond the Surface, which is gonna take us inside his uh, plastic surgery practice so we can see what goes on day to day and also follow some of his patients on the emotional journey because for some of them they're undergoing life-changing transformations so we're going to find out today just how he got to beverly hills and what's involved in his work what he's learned about skin and the best things that we can do for our skin as we age and also some of the treatment that he's using to deliver these exceptionally natural results. Dr. Truesdale, thank you so much because I know how busy you are. We've just been talking about how busy you are. So thank you for taking the time out to talk to me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming out to the office and seeing what we do out here in Beverly Hills. Well, I was gonna say, as addresses go, it doesn't get much bigger than Rodeo Drive, Beverly Hills for plastic surgery. I would love to know what the road to Rodeo looked like for you. I mean, was that a straight path or were there a lot of bumps and twists and turns along the way? It was as pretty straight as one could, could make. So directly, I came to Beverly Hills for my fellowship and immediately started my practice. So before I even finished my fellowship, I was looking at office space and you know, reviewing leases and immediately built out my first office, the one that you visited upstairs, yeah. and recently finished my second. So, you know, I am a young surgeon, but um, you know, a lot of doctors start off in a group practice or in a hospital, get their feet wet, and then make the big jump into solo practice. I immediately jumped into solo practice. So that is as straightforward as one could could look to achieve. Uh, you make that sound easy, but is that a risk setting up on your own this One, early on? <laughs> 100%. I mean, I took a big plunge. Yeah. Um, you know, as you know, most businesses fail. All businesses fail within the first, or not most, but you know, there's a high likelihood of failure for a small business in the first five years. And so in a medical practice, that's the same. So people are Beverly Hills doctors and then they move away because things don't work. So in the most competitive place, one of the most competitive places in the world to set up shop, it's pretty rare initially. I had proof of concept. So when I was in my fellowship, I was able to start building a pretty robust practice. Um, and my wife, thankfully at the time, had a really nice job. So she was kind of, you know, I knew that I had a backup. Mm -hmm. My backup was one, I've already made enough money to kind of understand that I can do this. Mm -hmm. And two, worse comes to worse, I can always do this later. But I felt that if I didn't take the plunge initially, that it would just delay, you know, how long it would take for me to get to my ultimate dream. Yeah. And I mean, you had done a, a surgical mission to Ghana previously. Mm -hmm. was that, how long ago was that? That was in my residency. So that was during my fourth year of residency. So that was two years before I even came to my fellowship. And how did that affect you working out there? I mean, it was life-changing. So a part of University of Michigan head and neck surgery, uh, otolaryngology program, you have the opportunity of doing time in Ghana. We work with one of the hospitals over there, Cath Hospital. Mm -hmm. And it's very different than the modern medicine that we practice here in the States. The diseases that they treat are different mm -hmm. because some of them you just read in textbooks, but also their access to, to equipment, to technology, and just their body of knowledge was less. So a part of the mission that the chairman had at University of Michigan was to bring some of that knowledge expertise over there, teach them techniques, um, do surgeries, and also learn as well. So I was able to have that experience, see people in need, see disease that I hadn't seen before, and really learn how to make the most of everything. Yeah. Um, and also get to do some really great teaching and life-saving surgery. It was really, really rewarding. And I mean, how does it, it's such a contrast between Ghana and Beverly Hills. Right. Do you notice, does it, does it impact the way you approach your work at all? 
So yes, in certain ways, I would say the contrast between Ghana and pretty much anywhere in the United States is just massive. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being there in the waiting room, I remember there were patients who just expired. They were like literally dying in the waiting room. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of understanding the body of knowledge of otology or ear surgery, they're many, many years behind. We're trying to bridge that gap. But I remember teaching the residents how to put in an ear tube. Mm -hmm. And in that country, there are, are very, very few people, if any, who had put in ear tubes. So you can imagine it's one of the most common, you know, per commonly performed surgeries in the United States and otherwise for chronic ear disease for children, for them to be able to develop their hearing. Um, not being able to do that is just massive. So kids grow up without being able to access sound, develop language, and me teaching, me a lonely resident, teaching their surgeons how to do an ear tube, it was probably the highest impact thing I've done medically in my entire career, um, or will do, because those 10 residents that I taught now will have that skill set that they can now treat thousands of people for ear disease. Yeah. So it changes your perspective um, in terms of, you know, I'm in Beverly Hills where money, access, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing elective surgery. Over there, elective surgery is not really a thing. It's yeah. medically necessary. Um, a lot more cancer. It's just a different side of medicine. Yeah. So it keeps you grounded. Yeah, absolutely. And that's important. Um, and we're going to get to see you at work in your new reality series, yeah. Beyond the Surface, which I'm going to link in the description. Mm -hmm. um, what do you hope that uh, people will take away from watching that? What can they expect? I think that they can expect to see a side of plastic surgery they've never seen before. It's coming we're in. We're busting at we the seams. It's, it's real. So when we watch plastic surgery or just medical shows in general, it's highly filtered Mm -hmm. highly produced from the result that you see. The doctors look like they walk on clouds. The patients- You don't walk on a cloud? I, no, no I left my cloud at home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, when you're, especially when you're thinking about facial plastic surgery, you're not really seeing up close. Mm -hmm. What do the scars look like? Mm -hmm. What's the real healing like? What are these patients' lives and their journeys really truly like? You're gonna see that. You're also going to see an unfiltered look at my life. So what is it like to have a patient who's unhappy? What is it like to deal with the stress of running a practice? You're gonna see these things. So I'm gonna get vulnerable. And uh, I think people will appreciate plastic surgery more because they will see real stories, real people, and they'll see results that look natural and beautiful. Um, so we'll hopefully open the minds and the hearts of people around the world. Yeah, well, I've had a little sneak preview. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I was really struck uh, by how natural the results were. And also, it looked to me like you were, you were doing several procedures, not just surgery, but um, fat transfer, mm -hmm. laser in some cases. Mm -hmm. It was all packaged in. Yeah to the one operation mm -hmm. um, and yet people have all that and they come out still looking natural. Yeah. 10 years ago, you knew when somebody had surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I recently um, interviewed a doctor on the channel, uh, Johnny Betteridge, and um, I mean, he's grown huge on Instagram just by explaining to people the surgery that he believes celebrities have had, you know, Brad Pitt and the likes, mm -hmm. he can tell by the little scar. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's changed in the last 10 years to allow you to deliver such natural results? The techniques have changed, the expectations of the patients have changed, and overall, I think the more nuanced uh, aesthetic of the doctors has evolved. Um, we're humans. We, humans have been around. The anatomy has been there. Scalpels, scissors, Sutures, they've all been around, but how you utilize them and how you approach each patient, that changes everything. So um, I think people are also seeing the value of a more subtle, um, it can be powerful, but subtle result, mm -hmm. less weird, pulled, stretched, altered. Yeah. People are, are appreciating that more. So a lot of it is technique, some of it is just people are making better decisions. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think people have become very switched on 
to the fact that surgery, you should not look stretched after mm -hmm. surgery, something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um, but I mean, within the techniques itself, is there anything you can explain as to how that's changed? Or is it just that surgeons now understand this is an art and not just a skill? It's hard because, you know, if you polled surgeons 20 years ago, they had artistry. Mm -hmm. Every surgery, there's art to it. But if you are the greatest artist in the world, but you don't have a good toolkit or you don't have a good methodology of laying down the paint, it's still not going to be as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. So our I think of plastic surgery as art. Mm -hmm. right? I'm a portrait artist myself. Yeah. And so each different technique has evolved. So you're asking me about, you know, when I add laser, I think of that as a blending tool. So the lasers have gotten better, right? The decisions and the type of laser, before it was ablative, full, face-off type laser. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have fractionated laser that's more specific or targeted or more open to different types of patients. So that broadens your canvas that you can use, right? In terms of the way a facelift was done commonly before, maybe that's a different technique than what we use today. And so you're able to achieve a little bit more of a natural result because we understand how the anatomy moves and the limitations for the technique for that specific person. So I think we have a wider palette and our palette itself has gotten better. Um, I think also the artistry has gotten a little bit better. and. To believe it or not, I mean, people have a microscope on their surgeon, so it demands you to be excellent. Yeah. If yeah. you are not excellent, if your results are not making it, then you won't get patience. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, because it's elective. Yeah. The fat transfer that I uh, seems to be used a lot now um, within plastic surgery, is that the gold standard over chemical fillers, if that's the right term, hyaluronic acid fillers. fillers. Yeah. Um, no, it is patient dependent in terms of what they are trying to achieve, the timeline, safety profile, and also location specific. So I can put fat anywhere in the face. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I should. Mm -hmm. I can put filler anywhere in the face. Doesn't mean that I should. Mm -hmm. So when I have a patient or I have a discussion with a patient about filler or fat, the first question is, well, are you against a surgical procedure? If the answer is yes, then fat is off the table. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't want to have a liposuction and something that's a little bit more permanent, definitely filler should go, you know, filler, you should be more of a candidate for filler. If you want me as a surgeon to augment your lip, I don't use fat to augment the lip. Mm -hmm. So I will use a hyaluronic acid. So I think that a result can be better achieved with filler in the lip than fat. Now there are surgeons who use fat to inject in the lip, um, but for me, there's no natural fat layer in the lip. Yeah. Fat doesn't move the same way that the supple tissue of the lip works. Um, if I want a filler that, or if I want to augment volume and I want it to be a little bit more rigid, then I might use something that's a filler rather than fat. Mm -hmm. You can't put fat everywhere in the face and it look great for certain people. So the risk profile is also a little bit different in terms of the complications. If you have something that is not pretty or a lump or a bump with fat, you can't really get rid of it. Yeah. It's a harder thing to deal with. So if someone is more nuanced or they do not want to have the risk of it not being perfect, mm -hmm. maybe fat's not a great option. So there's all of these little, you know, pros and cons that you have to weigh yeah. for each individual patient. And it always comes down to the trust in the practitioner and finding the right practitioner, which is something I'm asked a lot. I had a comment this morning. I was kind of scratching my head this morning trying to help this person because it was a lady who was overfilled. I, I get this a lot. Overfilled in a fat transfer. Mm -hmm. Um, and she just did not know where to go. What would you suggest in that scenario? Come see me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard. And that can happen not just because the person had, you know, too much filler or fat placed initially. If she has gained weight and say that fat was taken from her belly mm -hmm. and she's a person who gains weight in her belly, the fat will grow in yeah. the face. And so that's a hard problem to deal with. There are people who can deal with that. I'm one of them. And so a lot of times um, it's challenging though, 
you might have to lift up the face and do a facelift to see the fat yeah. and contour it. You can, with caution, selectively try to liposuction the fat away,、okay. um, but it's not an easy thing. It's not as simple as injecting some hyaluronidase and melting, the, yeah, you know, the filler. Exactly.、Away. So you wouldn't use something like radio frequency, which you could try that yeah, as well. Yeah,、um, you could try that as well, depending on the depth, depending on where it is,、mm -hmm. the contours, the surrounding structures. Yeah, that's another option. Um, the other thing I'm asked about a lot because、uh, it's been quite topical recently is there there were a group of plastic surgeons who warned against the use of I think they were talking about hyaluronic acid fillers specifically warning that they could theoretically block the lymph nodes、mm -hmm. and that could cause other health related issues. Have you any concerns about、um, dermal fillers in that sense? Definitely. And it's funny because you can't really predict who it's going to happen to. We have these sub subset of patients that we see who have had filler, and they have chronic swelling even when the filler is gone. And so the idea is that the lymphatic tissue, the drainage pathway, is blocked.、Mm -hmm. So there's some damage that's happened, similar to a person who's had. Um, breast cancer and had the lymph nodes taken out of their their arm. They have chronic arm swelling. So we see this.、Um, I think it's too much filler, inappropriately placed.、Mm -hmm. That's the higher likelihood of it happening, right? If you dump in too much filler, it's going to block the dam, right? It's like a beaver、yeah. putting in all the logs in. It can't. The water can't flow. So you definitely have concern about that. My approach to dermal fillers is subtle, less is more,、mm -hmm. more natural. So all of my work, you shouldn't be able to tell that my patient has had surgery. That's what I'm going、yeah. for.、Um, whereas in others, that's kind of they like that look. You're more likely to have that issue with that. Now, as it relates to other health concerns, I don't know the data, so I can't speak on that.、Um, as it relates to other illness. I don't know.、Uh, yeah, and I、possible. don't think there is data at this point. I think they were raising a theoretical yeah. risk. Yeah. yeah, I think it's definitely true. Yeah. Okay. So again, this comes down because people will be scared.、Um, it comes down to right practitioner at the end of the day, doesn't it? It's the decision. Every single time someone does something to your face. Every single time someone does something to your face, make sure they know what they're doing because it's your face.、Mm -hmm. And un facial plastic surgery is completely unforgiving because unlike a body, you know, a breast augmentation, if you do not like it, there is no permanent mask, there is no shirt, <laughs>、yeah. and so、uh, you want to go to someone who has all of the techniques available to them.、Uh, you know, back to the the canvas analogy, you want. Something you might need a a hammer, you might need a screwdriver, but if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You need to be able to choose in your toolkit which one is the best. Sometimes that's filler, sometimes that's fat. Difficult decision for people. I often go actually. I think a lot of people now do、um, on social media, looking at those before and after、mm -hmm. images and looking at how natural the results. Are which is what led me here. Yours are very natural. Thank you. And I think you can tell a lot by the practitioner. Social media helps us out like that, doesn't it? We'll come on to that because I'm interested in in your experience of, of social media. But I did want to ask,、um, as you're used to opening people's skin and looking at what's underneath, is there anything else、um, within the procedures that people can get done these days? The energy treatments and so on. Is there anything you've noticed that you think negatively impacts the health of the skin? One hundred percent. I mean, what have you noticed? I mean, anything taken too far hurts.、Mm -hmm. So if you drink too much water,、mm -hmm. hypo, you know, hypervolemia. It、yeah. causes a problem. If you、uh, breathe too quickly, hyperventilation. The same is the case with any treatment. So that can be filler. We've already spoken about、yeah. that. Filler migration. Um, you know, distorting tissue, expanding tissue that shouldn't be expanded. How do you expand tissue? What kind of treatments? Yeah, so if you overfill, if you yeah, overfill、uh -huh. the face, so、okay. I'm, I, you know, you can definitely see that the anatomy when you're trying to put it back, it has some memory that it wants to get back, but if it's been overfilled for a long period of time, right? Sometimes you're not able to actually get that person to be. 
the same form that they were before. So filler migration, overfilling, um, chronic swelling, energy devices, you spoke about that. I see that a lot in terms of skin that has excessive scar. Um, it's not moving the correct way. <laughs> the, the planes are difficult to dissect. The smaz layer or the kind of the the fascial layer overlying the facial muscles gets thinner. Um, people who have had kybella, I hate kybella, threads, all of these things do damage under the skin. And so it requires you to basically put your, your uh, Superman cape on and because it's harder to do those surgeries, um, you know, certain uh, non-dissolvable fillers, um, radius, all those kind of things in the face are more challenging to navigate. And something like radius, what are you seeing there? Is that is that scar tissue as well, or it's it looks almost like bone. It's like a white gritty uh, material, and so it's a great it's a great filler for certain areas. Yeah. In low volumes, right? And <laughs> you know, when you're not overdoing it, it can be a great filler. Mm -hmm. But um, if I'm using it, I don't use it really, but if I were, I would use it deeply. So it's out of the plane where the dissection would be if you're going to lift the face or do something otherwise to reposition the tissues. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times what I'm seeing is people are putting this in and they don't really know the tissue plane that they're supposed to be in. It's kind of haphazard. And so it causes the planes to stick together and creates risk as it relates to navigating the tissue planes. So ultimately, you want to be in the right place and not injure a nerve or a blood vessel or cause an issue with healing um, by being in the wrong place. So it's just, uh, you know, it, it puts a pothole on your road. Yeah. I mean, that is a big topic in its own right. I can, I can, yeah. I'm going to get so many comments about that. But, um, but I, I wonder, is there anything, any steer that you can give viewers on where you would definitely not put a biostimulator in jail? You said there was, it was appropriate for some Honestly, areas of the face. Or... Well, I mean, it's, I mean, I would not put them in anywhere in the under eye. Should never be thought of in the under eye. Yeah. Um, in the lip, definitely not. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, you can put it in the temple, you put it in the cheek, along yeah. the jawline. Yeah. Um, you could totally get away with that. It's really dependent on who's doing it yeah. and how they're doing it. Yeah, it That's, always comes yeah. back to that. And it's so tough for people, you know, they're, they're in an area, it depends who's local to you. And it's really about doing the digging, isn't it? Um, trying, to, trying to get a recommendation from people who have already had a, a positive experience. Um, you talked about the energy treatments there. Are there any that are better than the others? So, I mean, you've got things like ultrasound or radio frequency. Have you noticed in the skin you've looked at that one is having a, a worse impact on the health of the skin than All the other? Ulthera seems to be really, really damaging to the skin. Not dun, in... Dun, dun. <laughs> no, so I mean, it. the effect for the patient is a powerful one because it's melting the fat and it's tightening the skin. But when I look under the skin, it's thick scar that also wants to, so when scar is there, right, it wants to resist motion. So it's almost like a husk. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a little bit more challenging. Can you do it? Sure. Um, most of the energy treatments, the practitioner has to decide how much energy and the depth to put in. So all of them can be as damaging or more damaging depending on how much or where the treatment is. So I don't want to single out one specific energy device yeah. as the main offender. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all Thera, the, the faces that I have done, um, those look really scarred. Okay, well, I've had that treatment. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm now panicking. Um, it, would you say it's kind of multiple uses of that or can just one uh, I think treatment? one treatment of anything. Like I said, if you drink too much water, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the same thing. So it really depends. You can have a beautiful Althera treatment and it not look that horrible under the skin. So I'm not saying every single yeah. one, um, but what we do see is kind of a dose dependent response. So okay. the more energy that you put into the system, the better the result usually, but the more damage yeah. that you're doing. Now yeah. it's a selective damage, but it's still damage yeah. uh, because we weren't born with heat 
energy going under our skin and cooking us. Um, but if you use it in the right way, it can be a very effective, yeah. you know, and definitely a bridge if you're not quite ready for something a little bit more invasive, yeah. like a lift. No, I hear you. And actually, um, I think over the last year, 18 months, uh, what has become a, a recurring theme on my channel has been moderation exactly because of of the type of scenario you're talking about and and i kind of scaled back my own skincare routine mm -hmm. as a result mm -hmm. because i think people think of skincare as something that is just completely innocuous but um i've talked about for instance and i'd love to to get your view on this high strength uh prescription retinoids mm. which are the gold standard, okay? Do you take the view that that is the best thing you can do for your skin health? Or what do you see in people who use something like tretinoin daily long-term? And the best thing you can do for your skin health is to use sunblock. <laughs> and that's, that's number one. But yes, if it's not, if it's used too much, mm -hmm. then, or at a too high concentration, you can have side effects such as the overly glossy, really dry skin, Ultimately, what you're trying, you know, those medications, they decrease how oily the skin is. Yes. That pile of sebaceous unit, which is one of the things that helps regenerate the skin, helps regenerate the skin. Yes. So, you know, each thing has another side of the, of the coin. So it's a balance. Can you be on a retinoid long term? Yes. And it not cause a problem and be more beneficial than harmful? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's totally dependent on your specific skin and the dose that you're in. It's yeah. like, that's the theme of this podcast, I guess. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but do you know, it, it, it circles and it comes around to the same thing, but it's, it's good because, um, for instance, I had a microbiome specialist on recently who said the exact same thing, said, you know, this, they, you know, they work by drying up um, your own oil production. And at the end of the day, that's going to take out some of your good, bacteria on your skin and we're just beginning to understand mm -hmm. how our skin microbiome may actually feed into our wider microbiome gut brain it's i think there's so much to learn there if you were recommending the ultimate kind of skincare regimen what would you do I mean, what do you it do? really does. It really does require a consultation. Mm -hmm. I wish I could give a one size yeah. fits all, but I can't. Um, I can tell you what I use. Mm -hmm. um, so currently, I use Skin Better products. Mm -hmm. So, so Skin Better. It's, it's a lot of good science. There are different formulations. For me, I use the Duo. So it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a, a night version and a morning version. So within the kit, there's basically two things that I put on my skin, and I wear sunblock. That's it. There's a there's a retinoid, so it's not Retin A. Mm -hmm. That's a part of it. There are some. Um, acids mm -hmm. that help exfoliate the skin. Those are the two main things. There's an antioxidant in it as well, um, like a vitamin C derivative. So it's a, like a full package in that. So the basic skincare, a sunblock, moisturizer, exfoliant, something to peel away those layers of skin, something to turn the skin over, such as a retin, retinol or retinoid. Those are the basic components of a good skincare, moisture, right? But each skin responds differently, depending on the skin type, depending on how oily the skin is, oil prone, however dry the skin is, where you are, the environment that you're in, all of those things kind of play a role. So there's not a one size fit all. I want to ask about social media as well, because yeah. I noticed your own growth on Instagram and also YouTube. You've got yeah. a big YouTube channel as well. What difference does that make to business and the growth of your business. I mean, you have people now coming from all over the world. Yeah, presumably. from the UK. From the UK. Oh, and yeah, we get around. Yes. Yeah, so, um, no, you guys, you love, you love holiday. <laughs> you love, love holiday. holiday. We get two weeks holiday. You know, we could take longer That's holiday. Two weeks is enough time to recover from a, a deep plane phase of neck lift. So, um, well, I told you, I, I was hoping that your scalpel would slip because <laughs> I've got two weeks here. So, you know, it's, it's made the, the difference. So my business, the reason why I am uh, able to accelerate kind of my practice, I have the practice of someone who's been out for many, many more years than me because I'm able to show the world what I can do. Mm -hmm. So it, before when plastic surgery was, you know, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to find patients, people either had to know your name because you're the one guy in town 
or you'd have to pick up uh, you know the yellow pages and just like call like there was no internet so the great thing is I can be in front of thousands of people I can pick up my phone right now mm -hmm. and I can go live and I can be reaching if I went live right now I could probably get 5,000 people on there right now which is insane so that means 5,000 people can see my work connect and get to know me that makes a difference because you want to get to know who is cutting you who is your surgeon mm -hmm. so it kind of accelerates that relationship it also means that they can see my results so instead of just seeing like a website where you can't really interact and get to know the patients and who they are and what do they really look like three-dimensionally if you go on my instagram you can see how yeah. people really look um, you can hear them speak about their experience and so it it gets eyeballs, which drives people's interests, mm -hmm. and ultimately they can come and find you. So yeah, my business has grown dramatically because of social media. What, what's the dream? How, how big do you think this can go? Um, my dream is to touch as many lives with plastic surgery as I can. Um, I would love to continue to build my brand. Mm -hmm. So as it relates to uh, beauty, I want to be one of the big names mm -hmm. when it comes to thinking about aging, especially as I'm kind of on the front lines of opening the concept of beautiful plastic surgery, natural plastic surgery, it, to everyone, but in particular to the black community. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stigma still around plastic surgery for everyone, but it's lessening, but especially in the black community where I'm at the, the tip of the spear there. So. You know, it, the goal is if Michelle Obama wants a facelift, she's calling me. <laughs> if Oprah wants a facelift, she's calling me. That's the idea. Um, there's no, um, I have a very diverse practice. I take care of everybody. Yeah. But um, yeah, I would like to be, I like the practice to grow, treat more people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you will. That's why I got in early. Oh, thank Cause you. Because I thought in a couple of years time, you're not going to have time to talk to me. Anything else that you would like to share, particularly with the, with the upcoming series? Yes. So stay tuned. So uh, follow us on social media, Beyond the Surface, Truesdell Facial Plastic Surgery on YouTube. And each week we'll, we will be uh, showing a patient's journey in the realm of plastic surgery and a little bit about my life beyond the surface. It's going to be raw. It's going to be uncut. It's going to be a, a side of plastic surgery you've never seen. It's going to be amazing. Stay tuned. I just wanted to finish with um, a, a kind of the theoretical question that, that always comes up for me, a kind of debate on the channel, because I talk about healthy aging and how to age well. And I find it difficult sometimes to find that line that's right for everybody where on one hand, you've got people who say, we should just accept aging and just grow gracefully. And, you know, we shouldn't feel, we have to color our hair and zap every wrinkle. And on the other hand, we have all these amazing options now where mm -hmm. people can be 60 years old and look 40. Yeah. Um, I mean, why do people choose plastic surgery? And what's your take on that entire question? What does growing old gracefully look like to you? Growing old gracefully can mean that you live your life and you're happy every day. That's what growing old gracefully is, is every day is a gift. So if you are growing old, that is graceful because you have the fortune of having another day mm -hmm. because each day is not promised. Mm -hmm. So that's my perspective. If you're doing that happily and if you feel happy looking younger, plastic surgery all day if you don't care about that then live your life happily because you're growing old gracefully so it's not about the intervention it's about the mental perspective um, and that's what people are going to see on the show is it's not really about when a person comes to me I did an 81 year old man's revision facelift yesterday mm -hmm. he now looks like he's in his 50s he's got a husband who is 48 so they you know together they want to invest in how they look they care about that but he could live a perfectly happy life never meeting me or doing plastic surgery so the idea though in my mind is making the inside and the outside match mm -hmm. and if that makes you happy and you have the means to do it and you understand the risks and you are a candidate and it's done well yeah do it
zap that wrinkle, you know, as well, you know, you know, make sure that that crease goes away, zap that line, zap that pigment, um, you know, because you have the option and you only get one life as I know it. So live your life as happily and as effectively as you can. That is a wonderful note to finish on. Thank Beautiful. you so much for of your course. time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that was a real pleasure to meet Dr. Truesdale and his team. And so interesting to hear directly what an experienced and in-demand surgeon like him encounters when he looks under the skin and what we can learn from it. I'm back home again and reflecting on that conversation, I think it's an important reminder to all of us that there can be a trade-off with cosmetic interventions. And with so many options coming onto the market in recent years, there's been a bit of a gung-ho approach where we think we can undergo multiple treatments without any negative consequences whatsoever. And I think we're learning now that we have to be a bit more careful and cautious and choosing the right practitioner, someone highly experienced who takes a more considered approach, putting your interests first is everything. A reminder that you'll find a link to Dr. Truesdale's new reality show below. And don't forget, you can listen on the go to interviews like this with medical and healthy aging specialists on the Honest Channel podcast, available through YouTube Music, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You'll also find more expert advice and information from me on my website, honest.scott. But for now, thanks for joining me.